The 15th month of the unprovoked war in Ukraine is now behind us. And although the stalemate has set across the front, it seems like the calm before the storm. The second half of May will be remembered for a very high frequency of drone attacks by both sides, the almost complete capture of Bakhmut, Ukrainian raids into Russia, and an apparent breakthrough in discussions on the supply of Western-made fighter jets to Ukraine. Welcome to our latest update on the war in Ukraine. Spirited counterattacks and Western jets are a fantastic start, and we can all hope Ukraine is made whole as soon as possible, because time is of the essence. Many people are at a breaking point, inside and outside the country. Prices for essentials, which soared initially because of the invasion, are staying high globally, with grocery prices and shelter prices both up over 8% the past year. As prices for goods, gas, shelter and automobiles keep rising, the economy is cracking under the strain, with bank failures and market swings making headlines daily. However, certain markets are seeing a rush of interest, acting as stores of wealth during volatile times. One of these markets has even surpassed its pre-pandemic levels, fine art. Coming off a record-breaking year for the market, our longtime sponsor Masterworks is now up to a total of 13 sales themselves, every single one returning a profit. $45 million in assets sold, the net proceeds delivered to investors like you, maybe including some of you. Considering that's remarkable progress from the three exits Masterworks had when we started our partnership, it's also no surprise that they still have a waitlist, but you can skip it immediately at the link below. In this period, almost all notable battles resulting in territorial changes occurred in the Bakhmut section. On May 20th, Prigozhin declared that Wagner captured all of Bakhmut. The following day, Putin congratulated the Wagner Group and the Russian units who took part in the Battle of Bakhmut. The Ukrainian command refuted the claim of complete capture of Bakhmut by stating that Ukraine still controls the westernmost outskirts of the city, namely the MiG-17 monument, but at this point this has only a symbolic meaning. The capture of Bakhmut would mean something on a strategic level only if the Russian army had enough offensive capacity to attack Slovyansk and Kramatorsk. At this point, nothing indicates that Russia is preparing to continue its offensive operations in this section and develop its success in Donbass. It took seven bloody months for the Russian army, particularly the Wagner Group, to capture Bakhmut. According to Prigozhin, Wagner lost 10,000 former inmates and 10,000 contract fighters in the Battle of Bakhmut. He also claimed that Wagner had recruited 50,000 inmates since the war started, meaning that 20% of them have died in Bakhmut. The former commander of the pro-Russian separatists in Donbass, the man of too many names, Igor strelkov gherkin believes that Prigozhin is downplaying losses, and the actual number of KIA suffered by the Wagner Group may be as high as 40,000. We do not know about the Ukrainian losses, but it's safe to assume that they've lost way fewer men as the defending side. Was it worth it for Russia to lose so many men in frontal assaults while degrading its assault capacity in the process? Russian propaganda has been trying to portray the capture of Bakhmut as a decisive victory, similar to the capture of Berlin in 1945, but the scales are so different that it's not even worth discussing this propaganda narrative. Was it worth it for the Ukrainian army to continue defending Bakhmut instead of withdrawing? We will only know when we have credible information about the Ukrainian losses in this battle and the ratio of casualties. For now, Prigozhin has stated that Wagner units are leaving Bakhmut to lick their wounds, as they are transferring their positions to the regular units of the Russian army. While Russia captured or almost captured Bakhmut in this period, they continued losing ground to the Ukrainian army in the northern flank of this section, around Dubovy Vesolivka, Kromova and Bakivka, and Klischivka in the south. Russia has been reinforcing the flanks by deploying units from the North Luhansk front and different sections of the Donbass front. For now, Ukrainian attacks on the flanks of Bakhmut seem like localized counterattacks. They are a long way off from encircling the Russian units inside Bakhmut, which seems like the end goal of the Ukrainian army in this section. The Ukrainians have also regained some positions north of the village of Sako Ivanseti following the assault of the 30th Mechanized Brigade on May 22nd. Elsewhere on the Donbass front, the Ukrainian 53rd Mechanized Brigade gained some ground north of Apitna. During this period, 
The Russian army made several minor gains on the North Luhansk front. They have made progress in the Serebriansky forest towards Hryhorivka, captured some land west of Chavonopapivka and in the southeast of Bilohorivka. Still, this is way short of achieving the main goals of the Russian offensive in this area going on for several months, including the defeat of the Ukrainian bridgehead in the east of the Oskil River, along with the capture of Bilohorivka and Liman to put pressure on Slovyansk. As we have already reported, Russia is moving some of its units from this front to the flanks of Bakhmut, which may indicate that they are deprioritizing offensive actions in North Luhansk. In this period, the Ukraine-supported Russian Volunteer Corps and Freedom of Russia Legion made two ground incursions into Russian territory. On May 22nd, they entered and temporarily occupied several settlements in the border region of Belgorod. Russian sources have claimed that the raiding party consisted of two tanks, an armoured personnel carrier and nine other armoured vehicles. Representatives of these groups shared a video where they claimed that they were entering a fight to liberate Russia from Putin. A quick and almost uninterrupted advance of these groups caused disbelief and anger in the Russian public. According to one of the commanders of the raiding party, the reaction of the Russian army was inadequate and it took hours for them to organize some kind of proper resistance. Eventually, General Lepin, who Prigozhin and Kadyrov heavily criticized for the catastrophic defeat by the Ukrainians during the autumn Kharkiv counteroffensive, and the 74th Motor Rifle Brigade were tasked with repelling the pro-Ukrainian group. On May 23rd, these groups withdrew to Ukraine after destroying and capturing some Russian equipment. The Russians also claimed the destruction of several pieces of Ukrainian equipment, but some commentators on social media and Russian telegram channels have questioned the authenticity of the images. The presidential aide Mikhailo Podolyak has refuted Ukraine's involvement in this raid, and implied that these groups operated independently, even though it is extremely unlikely for an armed group to have tanks and armoured vehicles without a government supply. Podolyak touched upon this by mocking the Russians, saying, you can buy tanks in any military supply store. This is an allusion to Putin's denial of Russian involvement in 2014 in Crimea and Donbass, when he said, you can buy them in any military supply store about Russian military uniforms. The Ukrainian government has almost certainly created these groups to conduct missions on Russian territory while maintaining relatively plausible deniability. Several Ukrainian officials have already discussed the necessity of creating a demilitarized zone on the Russian side of the Russo-Ukrainian border as an important condition of Ukraine's future security. This demand may be a bargaining chip in future negotiations with Russia. Still, actions like this demonstrate that Ukraine can and will cross the Russian border to prove its willingness to take the fight into Russian territory. Raids like this also force Russia to fix more troops on the border, preventing them from being deployed in Ukraine and creating discontent among the Russians. Evidently, deploying more troops on the border has not helped Russia much, as on June 1st, another raid was conducted in the Belgorod Oblast. The Russo-Ukrainian border is just too long to prevent all raids like this effectively, but each of these raids further derails the Russian confidence in victory in Ukraine. In this period, both sides picked up the pace of frequency of the strikes on enemy territory. Russia has used a variety of options, including Shahed drones and Kinjal, Iskander, KH and Kaliber missiles during its strikes on Ukraine on May 16th, 18th, 19th, 20th, 22nd, 24th, 25th, 26th, 28th, 29th, 30th and June 1st. They have conducted strikes on at least 17 different days in the period of May to June 1st. 59 Shahed drones were launched on May 28th only, which is the most mass use of these Iranian-made strike drones since the start of the war in one day. Although the Ukrainian air defense is now stronger than ever with Patriot systems, the sheer amount of missiles and drones launched by the Russian army at times prevent the Ukrainians from shooting down all targets. Much footage reflects destruction in residential areas caused by Russian strikes but at least some of them have reportedly hit military targets as well. For instance, the May 29th strike caused damage to five aircraft in the military airbase in the Hemelnitsky Oblast. Evidently, Russia has switched its attention from the Ukrainian energy infrastructure and is trying to hurt the Ukrainian military infrastructure on the eve of its counter-offensive, which makes sense. 
some Russian military bloggers mock the methods in which the Russian army chooses the location of its strikes, stating that they use the Soviet-era maps instead of relying on the current intelligence, which causes the destruction of residential areas or clear mishits. But the increased frequency of Russian strikes also demonstrates that the claims of Ukrainian officials that Russia is running out of cruise missiles may have been premature. On May 19th, the deputy chief of Ukrainian military intelligence, Vadim Skibitsky, claimed that Russia is capable of producing up to 25 caliber missiles, 35 kh missiles, two Kinjals, and five 9M723 ballistic missiles for Iskander M systems in a month due to continued import of necessary components despite the sanctions. Missile debris demonstrates that some of the lately used missiles have been manufactured very recently. So Russia will most likely maintain its capacity to conduct strikes on Ukraine in the foreseeable future. Still, the arrest of several Kinjal missile developers indicates that the Russian government is angry to find out that these missiles are not as invincible as they were advertised, following the news of six shot down Kinjal missiles on May 16th. Ukraine conducted several strikes of its own in this period. The oil depots in the Krasnodar Oblast were targeted several times. On May 30th, at least 25 Ukrainian drones traveled all the way to Moscow, targeting the affluent residential districts of the Russian capital. At least some of the drones reached their targets, which shows that the Russian air defense is not fully capable of defending Moscow. Skibitsky has told the German press in an interview that the elimination of Putin remains a priority for Ukrainian military intelligence. At this point, this does not sound like a realistic goal, but the fact that Ukrainian drones have struck the Kremlin and an area presumably close to one of Putin's residences in the Moscow Oblast within a short period of time may indicate that the Ukrainian government is trying to keep Putin under pressure. A few days before that, on May 24th, at least one Ukrainian naval drone hit the Russian military intelligence ship Ivan Kurz in the Black Sea, damaging the ship. The Ukrainian army has also continued successfully using its long-range Storm Shadow missiles, according to the Defense Minister Reznikov. As of May 28th, all launches have struck their targets. For instance, on May 20th, several Storm Shadows struck the port of the Russian-occupied Berdyansk, while on May 30th, a Russian military base was hit in the Mariupol district. Messages of the Ukrainian officials in this period strongly suggest that the Ukrainian army may start active offensive operations very soon. On May 25th, Podolyak stated that the Ukrainian counter-offensive would be dozens of different actions which have already started and will continue. His words may suggest that the counter-offensive has already started, but statements of other officials suggest that it has not. On May 27th, the Secretary of the National Security Council, Danilov, revealed that Ukraine is ready to start its counter-offensive, which may be launched tomorrow or a week later. He added that Ukraine does not have a right to commit mistakes and lose this historic opportunity. A day later, Zelushny stated that all the preparations for the counter-offensive had been completed and the army was waiting for the decision. And Zelensky's statement that the Ukrainian leadership has approved the dates for the start of the movement of our troops and decisions have been made indicates something will happen very soon. These messages imply that the Ukrainian army has received all or most of the promised tanks, armored vehicles, and other equipment crucial for their counter-offensive. But the Ukrainian government continues actively seeking more military support, particularly with Western-made fighter jets and more long-range missiles. On May 16th, Le Monde claimed that British Prime Minister Sunak and Dutch Prime Minister Rutte had agreed to build an international coalition to support Ukraine with fighter jets and training of its pilots. Two days later, CNN reported that while the US government does not intend to give F-16s to Ukraine, it is not going to block its allies from supplying the fighter jets to Ukraine, which is an important change of policy of the Biden administration on this matter. The US National Security Advisor Sullivan later confirmed the American participation in the fighter jet coalition, adding that the United States would be ready to train Ukrainian pilots on F-16s, but would not enable or support its use on Russian territory. At this point, it looks like the main question with the supply of F-16s is not if, but when. 
According to Sullivan, as the training unfolds in the coming months, we will work with our allies to determine when planes will be delivered, who will be delivering them, and how many. Later, Denmark and Portugal confirmed their participation in the coalition as well, as they stated their readiness to train Ukrainian pilots and discuss the supply of F-16s. It is a major breakthrough for Ukraine. The fourth-generation fighter jets will make a huge difference in helping Ukraine's embattled and constantly busy air defense and participating in offensive operations. Fighter jets are the only component where the Ukrainian military is weaker than Russia in terms of the capability of the available equipment, and supply of F-16s will solve this issue and prevent the Russian Air Force from active involvement in the war. The Ukrainian Defense Ministry official Yuri Sak has stated that Ukraine may start getting its first F-16s in September to October of 2023. The spokesperson of the Ukrainian Air Defense, Inat's message, clearly shows the excitement of the Ukrainian leadership about F-16s. When we'll get F-16, we will win the war. But F-16 may not be the sole option on the table for Ukraine. On May 25th, the Swedish Defense Minister, Pal Jonsson, confirmed that Sweden would allow Ukrainian pilots to train on Gripen fighter jets. Ukraine is also actively seeking more long-range missiles to accompany its arsenal of Storm Shadow missiles. On May 18th, French President Macron confirmed that France would give Scalp EG long-range missiles, which are basically Storm Shadow. On May 28th, Ukraine officially requested Taurus air-launched long-range missiles with a range of 500 kilometers and a warhead of 481 kilograms from Germany. Ukraine has also received several other pledges of military support from its allies. On May 16th, the German defense industry company Hensolt reported about a contract signed with Ukraine on the supply of six TRML-4D air surveillance radars, costing 100 million euros. On May 18th, the Norwegian defense minister informed about the delivery of eight M270 MLRS and three Arthur counter-battery radar systems together with Britain. On May 19th, the Pentagon reported about an accounting error which has overestimated the cost of military support to Ukraine by at least $3 billion. This means that now the Pentagon has an extra $3 billion available to support Ukraine, which probably means more military assistance in the upcoming months. On May 20th, the United States announced another military aid package worth $375 million, including more HIMARS munition, artillery shells, Tau anti-tank guided missiles, and more Javelin portable anti-tank missiles. On May 31st, they pledged more missiles for Patriot, tank ammunition, Zuni aircraft rockets, Avenger air defense systems, and Stinger manpads, among other things. On May 23rd, Germany promised more military aid, including Bieber armored bridge layers, vector recon drones, anti-drone systems, and dozens of vehicles. On the same day, the EU foreign policy chief Borrell informed about the supply of 220,000 artillery shells and 1,300 missiles by the EU since March 2023, along with a new tranche of economic aid worth 1.5 billion euros. On May 24th, the US authorized the sale of NASAM's air defense systems to Ukraine, while the Ukrainian ambassador to Germany tweeted about the intention of Germany to supply 110 Leopard 1 tanks. On the same day, the Netherlands pledged to allocate 260 million euros to procure 155 mm artillery shells for Ukraine. Around the same time, the Wall Street Journal reported about South Korea's secret supply of hundreds of thousands of artillery shells to Ukraine which has been rumored for several months. On May 25th, Finland declared that they would send anti-aircraft weaponry and ammunition worth 109 million euros. On the following day, Canada promised 43 AIM-9 air-to-air missiles. On May 27th, the New York Times reported that 400 Ukrainian servicemen had started training on Abrams tanks in Germany. On May 29th, Danish Prime Minister Frederiksen stated that Denmark would increase its military aid budget to Ukraine by $2.6 billion in 2023 and 2024. So, the Western allies are doing their part to support Ukraine. Hungary remains the sole exception, continuing to delay European support to Kyiv. On May 16th, Hungary blocked an upcoming tranche of military support to Ukraine. The Hungarian Prime Minister, Orban, 
is known for his pro-Russian and anti-Western attitude. But so far, Budapest's attempts to delay or block the support to Ukraine have been nothing more than a nuisance, since other allies always find a way to deliver. In the meantime, Ukraine's EU accession is getting more support, as on May 23rd, German Chancellor Scholz expressed his confidence that Ukraine will join the EU following its victory. There have been several other notable diplomatic developments in this period, including the extension of the grain deal on May 17th, an agreement between Russia and Belarus to deploy nuclear weapons to Belarus on May 25th, a call from the Chinese Special Representative for Eurasian Affairs, Li Hui, for a ceasefire, which would mean that Russia retains its control over the occupied territories on May 26th that has been strongly condemned by Ukraine. On May 29th, the Wall Street Journal reported that Saudi Arabia demanded Russia follow the agreement on decreased oil extraction. On May 17th, sources in Washington DC told the Financial Times that the feeling in the American capital is that the next five months are going to be the last and decisive chance for Ukraine to change the situation. Ukraine has received a lot of support from its Western allies, an effort which the US has spearheaded. Now Ukraine has to deliver results if it intends to rely on further Western support. The momentum to support Kyiv may wane if the Ukrainian counter-offensive does not achieve any meaningful results. The United States will have a presidential election next year, and the discourse around it has already started. The lack of results by Ukraine would put the Biden administration in a difficult spot, which will surely be used by forces opposing military aid to Ukraine. The Ukrainian army will have to be successful in this window without muddy terrain between now and sometime in October to continue getting supported by the West. Now let's look at the visually confirmed equipment losses by both sides as of June 2nd, according to the Oryx blog. For Russia, these are 2,003 tanks, 4,086 vehicles, 243 command posts and communication stations, 733 artillery systems and vehicles, 202 multiple rocket launches, 82 aircraft, 90 helicopters, and 243 drones. For Ukraine, these are 509 tanks, 1,521 vehicles, 13 command posts and communication stations, 310 artillery systems and vehicles, 45 multiple rocket launchers, 67 aircraft, 30 helicopters, and 127 drones. Nobody likes sponsors cutting into the video's flow, but a channel like ours can't survive without sponsors. At some point, we'd like to stop relying on the sponsors and present our videos sponsor-free to everyone. To do that, we need at least 10,000 YouTube channel members and patrons. Your kind support is always appreciated, we would not be able to create so many videos without you. Channel members and patrons get weekly exclusive videos, like our finished series on the Peloponnesian War, and the ongoing series on the Italian Wars of Unification, Risorgimento, as well as the Anabasis of Xenophon and the History of Prussia, as well as many interesting non-serialized videos. Our supporters also get our schedule, early access to the videos, access to our exclusive Discord, and much more. Thank you for supporting us. The war continues, and we will continue covering it, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.